Hello, this is Darren Pulsifer, Chief Solution Architect of Public Sector at Intel, and welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. On today's episode, the things I wish I knew as a government CTO with special guests Jason Dunpotter and Ron Fitzmeyer. Jason, Don, Ron, welcome to the show. I almost called you uh, Don, Ron. There you go. I've been called worse. My <laughs> oh, people I like better. <laughs> uh, Jason was a uh, retired chief warrant officer of uh, the Army and now a solutions architect and mission specialist at Intel. And Ron was uh, is a retired um, rear admiral in the Navy and now part of our uh, Department of Defense team, a solution architect and a mission specialist himself. You guys, it's great to have you on the team. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. So I was say Jason, but I'm happy for Jason as well. Thanks, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell we have a lot of fun uh, with, with uh, our team. And um, both of you have kind of run in the gamut of CTO at different levels. In what in what you've been doing, so I, you know, one of my peers said, "Hey, Darren, you got to have these guys on the show. It's they. There's lots to learn from them on when they were CTOs, and now that you guys have been retired now for it's been like four months, five months now, five months for both of you, right? About that. Yep. 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 All right. So the first question goes to Jason. What have you learned in the last five months that you wish you knew when you were still in the military? Well, I, uh, I wanted to start with saying thanks for having us on the podcast, but I will tell you that uh, we told this story to a, a bunch of folks two weeks ago at a CTO summit. And we were like, first thing we said was, hey, I blame all of you, uh, industry <laughs> partners, right? Absolutely blame all of you for all of the problems in the DOD, because you have solved all the technology problems, but you never told anybody. You have, you know, we've learned a lot about AI and cloud integrations and other people's servers versus true cloud operations. We've learned a lot about how you do business and industry and why that we just never got that in the DOD, especially from the speaking from the army team. Um, we, we can learn a lot from how you're already doing things. Um, and I, and I, and I really got after them saying, Hey, you got to get after this and, and start talking to people better. Okay. I'm going to drill you a little bit on that. So I want to reiterate, you're saying it's not about the products. You want to know how to use the products effectively is what you're Correct. saying. Correct. Absolutely. Right. Like how, how better to integrate solutions because you have them. You already have designed, developed, optimized and efficient side, you know, efficiency developed all these great capabilities that I've learned about in the last four or five months. I wish I knew about three, four years ago that we could have just rolled right in and went nuts with. Gotcha. So you, you really want outcome selling. You, you want us to tell you about outcomes and solutions, not points, point products and hey, buy this, buy this latest gizmo from us. Really, it's key is showing business use cases, show us how you can solve a problem and actually understand the customer's problem. Um, so I think the largest concern is a lot of times folks come to these events and these trade shows and things, and they don't understand, they don't understand the customer's actual problem set, right? They actually just understand their technology and they're pushing their technology, which it's fantastic technology, but you got to really understand what are they, what problems do they have? What are they trying to solve? And, and like we said this during the thing, as a CTO, you have two problems. The first is you have to know everything about every technology ever made. And then you have to learn how to change the culture of every member of your team to adapt into new technology. <laughs> so you either change the people or you change the people, right? So at the end of the day, those are your two things. Industry could have just come in right behind you and said, hey, I can solve both of those problems by making the user experience easier to understand, you know, build the technology smarter, leaner, faster. And then also, help get people on board by making it a smoother transition, right? By understanding what you're trying to solve. Okay, now this sounds like this is just an army problem. Is that right, Ron? No. Ron, come on, Ron, give us the truth on the Navy side. Is This is just the army can't figure this out, right? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's an army problem. No, no, seriously. <laughs> it, uh, fr frankly, I, I would suggest it's, it's universal. I, I, I yeah. can't tell you from you know my early part of the career as an engineer, uh, I saw signs of this. And then as you kind of, you know, mature through your career over time, you see it in different ways. But just if I can give sort of a, a silly example of this, sitting down, I, you know, running an organization where I have, have the, the folks who say, okay, I'm the operator. 
I've got to go out and execute a mission. And then I have, if you will, the engineers. And sometimes those could be inside government. And most of the time, they're usually industry that's supporting us, right? And to have the conversation between the two, it kind of reminds me, I go back to what you know my mom used to say growing up, right? Is that God gave you two ears and one mouth, use them in that proportion, and you'll be much better off for it. We have such a tendency for the technology folks to want to tell the operators what about the technology rather than hearing what's the operational and mission outcome that you're looking for and, and vice versa. Sometimes you have the, the government side, as I'll say, the operator, if you will, that wants to tell the technology folks, just give me the following, right? And, and more often than not, they're both half right and half wrong. And so I think the challenge that I saw from inside the government was trying to learn how to get industry to come alongside as a mission solution partner and bring the technology into that so that I could help inform them from the mission standpoint and they could better inform my team on how to apply their technology into my mission. So I think Jason made a great point. Great technology, but without an understanding of how you're gonna solve the actual mission problem, which means you have to understand the mission space, uh, almost always uh, creates a potential train wreck. So this is one of the reasons why Intel actually hired you guys because you understand the mission space so well and now we're training you up on all this technology and stuff. Um, so it, to me, it sounds like um, walking in someone else's shoes is really important here, right? I think that's sure. a great way to describe it. You know, this kind of reminds me, uh, I had a professor in my undergraduate studies. It was a um, software engineering class. And we had to design a, uh, a garden program, a, a, a program that would help gardeners um, mm -hmm. uh, arrange their garden most effectively. And, and the, the company that we were doing this for was called the Little Grow, Green Grow Seed Company. Doesn't exist. It was just something that we did. And we spent, worked in teams for, for the whole semester working on this program to make it all work. And we had to hand in all the paperwork and the process, everything around it. And he goes, the best one that's ever handed this in went to the bookstore, bought a ledger book and wrote instructions on how to keep track of things. And we spent hundreds of hours working on this because we were all about technology without asking the, prod the, the mission specialist, without asking them, what are you doing here? What's your, pro what's your problem? So we, we learned a valuable lesson. And he did that on purpose, obviously, because he wanted us to say, you have to listen to the customer. And that's what you guys are telling, telling me now, right? Absolutely. I think the other thing is that uh, from a technology standpoint, we've talked about this a lot. User experience is everything. If you know, we don't have enough workforce, we will never have enough workforce at the skill level that you need to do all of the things that you need to do, especially in cybersecurity, especially in integration. There's too much work, there's too much lift. Um, and so I don't have the you know, 20, 30 years to get educational experience, but I'll give you a great example. Um, so my wife's non-electrician, right? Let's just be clear about that. She's a veterinary technician. She's great at what she does. She's super bright, has no knowledge of electrical flow and things, right? She breaks things. But what's really great is when the power goes out, and the lights are off and she flips on the switches and nothing happens. The first thing she does is grabs a flashlight, goes to the garage, flips the master circuit breaker, right? Nothing happens. Then she walks outside and looks at the neighbor's lights to see if they're off too, right? Based on that, she can troubleshoot the electrical grid enough that she can call the power company and tell you, hey, my block is out and hey, we got a problem, right? So that's a user I love experience, that. right? You, you, you just, you don't need a PhD in engineering to understand your power's out what the problem is and who to report it to. You can do a lot from a user experience without needing the level of education that we're trying to build to. I'm not saying education is not important. I'm saying it's absolutely paramount, especially for your executive leadership. But you've got to build a user experience where you don't need you know, 100,000 hours to turn on the first switch in your network, right? You've got to get it to where you can build those user experiences for the levels of skill sets that you have. So a lot of times we build complexity into solutions because we want flexibility and configurability. Sure. Right. So are you saying it would be better if we were opinionated in our solution sets and saying, this is the way it's going to work? So I think it's two sides, right? I think that you should have that flexibility when you need it. 
Um, but in most cases, you don't need it. In a lot of cases, you don't need it. Um, and sometimes the default settings, well, let me ask you this. Do you go into Windows and change every setting in all of the, you know, uh, in, in the entire rootkit? Um, I used to, but not anymore, right. no. Right, but most people don't. No, and they somehow don't. they can go to work, they can print what they need, they can email what they need, they change their desktop, they change a few of their camera settings, their monitors, and they call it, right? Well, it's the same thing with the power, power grid. You're not changing the power to three-phase power running at 30 hertz in your house, right? Why would yeah. you do that? Because right? everything's be been standardized. Yeah, Ron, go ahead. So, so we need to be realistic about matching the, the technology is about achieving a mission outcome. Right. And I think sometimes the technologists lose sight of that mission outcome is an almost no case independent of human beings who are in some part of that cycle of achieving that mission outcome. And, and the technology allows us to do incredibly amazing and complex things. But if it's not matched to the people who have to operate it, and, and, and frankly, it's, it's not on a good day that I worry about. It's on the worst possible the worst day, day that yeah. I worry about it, right? That if you don't match that to the ability of your operators, you're, the best technology is still going to fail you. Um, you know, just a couple of years ago, talking with uh, the, the Commodore or the commander, if you will, of a destroyer squadron. So he's responsible for about seven ships, right? Each ship has on the order of 300 personnel on it. And he's, he, he's responsible for ensuring sort of overall training and operational capability of that small fleet, if you will, right? And, and talking with him, in this case, it was about managing the IT enterprise on board these ships and maintaining them securely. And he said, I can tell you just based on the trouble reports, I know where I happen to have my A plus sailors. Interesting. He said, he said, but you know what the average sailor I get in the fleet is? C, that's the very definition of average, right? Yeah, yeah, oh said, yeah. So it's, it's not a knock on the people. It's the nature of the challenge of the human workforce that we have to be able to make successful in this business. And he said, if they're not an A plus sailor in this particular space, I have incredible numbers of ongoing challenges to meet the needs, right? So that to me is one of those areas when we talk about uh, industry bringing solutions to defense or frankly to any customer, it, it's you need to understand the entire space. Understanding the mission is not just the technolog uh, technological needs of the mission, it's how you're gonna operate in that space. And in almost every case that involves the people that have to be part of that. And in the case of the military in particular, I would say, You've got to also plan to execute in that, uh, what I think of as the pucker factor moments, right? When things have not gone well, but you still got to make it work. And if you aren't doing that, then the best technology is still not going to win the day. I, I love what you guys are saying here. I mean, I think we kind of forget this sometimes, right? Most of the, the people in the military are young, right? Very. And right? energetic. And and energetic, right. but you, you said average is C, right. that by definition, right? So we can't assume that everyone everyone can have a CSNA when they're, you know, managing, you know, VMs on a ship or on a base, right? And, and don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, we have some incredible sailors. Oh, yeah. Even well, our sea sailors yeah. get a lot of training, but particularly in a military context, right? In most cases, when it really matters, you're not going to be near a bevy of technical specialists. You've got to run with the folks that are part of your team. And to be able to produce technology that can be operated and maintained by those folks who have a whole bunch of other things that they also have to do is really challenging. But that's exactly where industry can really come in if they're ready to truly listen and come to that level of understanding and engage with the government uh, mission owners, if you will, to work through that space. Uh, that makes sense. I, I guess your technical resources can't Google something if if they're in the middle of a battle. Hey, wait, I got to go Google on how to how to change <laughs> hey, this. I'm not going to lie. That's never happened ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
So I, I appreciate everything that you guys do. I really do. But now that you're out, what has been some of the biggest surprises or most interesting surprises for you guys uh, getting out of the military and now being in private life? We'll start with Jason on that one. So I will tell you, I was really surprised about the culture at Intel. Um, it had oh, a much really? more family feel. Yeah, because I was told, hey, don't go to industry. They're not like us, right? We, you know, I'll be honest, in the Army, and I'll cry with you, uh, it's, a, it's a family of business. Like, it is a cultural family business. We care, invested in the people we have. It is our thing. The tools and the technology are literally just tools. They are literally like hammers I put on a shelf at the end of the day. It's the people, the relationships. I mean, I'm heartbroken about some of the things, right? About all of the years and things we've seen and the people we've been with and things they've been through. And, and just the emotional toll of moving your family every three to four years or two to three years or 18 months in my case, right? We've had a few of those twice in one year move. Um, and that's hard. That's hard with kids. It's hard with families. And so I didn't expect that cultural like caring um, in an industry because I was told, hey, don't be, pre be prepared. It will be different. And then I discovered is it's actually not that much different. Um, I will tell you, I've had quite a few incidents in the last four months, uh, whether it's buying a house or moving or having some life events. And everybody's reached out. Everybody said things that, you know, I didn't expect. Everybody like helped me solve problems. They, they integrated me well. I, I went really, I, you know, I got to give a personal shout out to Anna in my first week, right? Sent me a ton of stuff. Anna Scott like killed it. Um, Cause I was like, man, I don't know anything or anybody or anything <laughs> about anything. And it was like the week of Christmas, right? And I'm trying to figure out how to turn on the machine and do the stuff. And she's like emailing me, asked for an hour of my time, gave me an overview of the company and everything I needed to know to be successful in my first 90 days. I mean, like I didn't expect any of that onboarding. I didn't expect any of that personal touch care responsibility or anything like that. I really expected to just be handed a thing and say, hey, go row. And then that was it. All right. So that's a good one. Also, we don't force you to wear a uniform every day. So you get to wear whatever you want now, Jason. So Oh, don't say that. I'll be in a t-shirt tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. All right. What about you, Ron? What did you find that was surprising that you weren't expecting moving from, um, you know, public service to the private sector? Yeah, I, actually, I need to kind of jump in a little bit with what Jason was saying, because, um, you know, the, the shared sacrifice. So everybody's heard the story about, you know, when you're in the foxhole, what are you fighting for? And people like to say, well, I'm fighting for the, the nation. And while that's true, at the end of the day, you're fighting for the buddy that's next to you, right? To try right. and save their hide as well. And, and so not having kind of that expectation of what that would look like uh, moving into industry, <clears throat> I think within the first week, one of the first notes that I sent uh, back to, to Greg, our manager, was I can't tell you how exciting it is for me to be, have joined a group where my sense is that we're a team. And everybody is there to support you and help you be successful. And is just looking for helping you so that you can help them increase that success. And, uh, you know, my, my whole career, that's always been the part that I felt best about is being able to be part of a team because you can make things greater than you ever could yourself if you have a really good team. Now, that said, I will tell you in, in parts of the military, especially when you get into sort of the acquisition business, some great people, great teammates. But as a general rule, what program managers learn is to figure out those things that are the most risky to your success as a program manager and get them under your control. And what that inherently tends to do is it tends to cause people want to create stovepipes because you can stay in control. Where, where really being part of a dynamic team requires being willing to, I'll say, put yourself at risk because you're, you're now counting on somebody else for stuff that otherwise you'd like to control yourself. But the benefit of it is just incredible. And so I, I've always thought that was the space I wanted to be in. And when I've had those kinds of opportunities, it's been great. But I, I was uh, happily surprised coming into Intel just within the first few days of just sort of seeing that, that broad attitude of we're all in this together. How do we help each other uh, make this work? So you know, it's truly delightful. It is unique to Intel, frankly. I have to tell you, I've, I've uh, been at Intel for 12 years. And I've been working in the industry for more than 12 years, obviously, with my white hair, everyone could see that. Um, but yeah, it's unique at Intel, especially in this public sector team. We're all out here to, to help. And, and I really think our mission at Intel Public Sector is to help our government become more effective and efficient in, in mission. And I truly believe that. Darren, if I can add to that, that 
while it, it wasn't a surprise to me, it was a condition of me coming to Intel. When oh, I, I was love that. Inter, when I was interviewing, yeah. one of the points that I, I tried to make is that I'm, I'm looking for, you know, I'm ending my government career. I'm not ending my professional career. This is just a transition for me. And I will tell you the thing that I have always valued about in my career as service and in particular national service, right? And, and so I'm looking for this next part of my career where I can still be engaged, but from a different perspective. And so that notion of being able to come to a place that says our job is not merely to quote, sell Intel product. Of course, you expect that to happen. That's at the end of the day, it is a business, but our job is to help the customer solve mission challenges. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes that even means this is what we think you need. And today, if the best answer is not exactly what we have to offer you, I want to make sure that that customer knows what their best options are. Now, I believe that Intel will continue to evolve and be you know, the world-class leader in this space. And so I feel good about being part of this team. Mm -hmm. That said, I came because I was told we need you to help inform the customer so that they can get the best possible capability to solve their mission needs. Uh, totally, One totally caveat that, though. Yeah, but yeah. caveat though is also to tell Intel what the customer really needs. That's, yeah. the, that's the feedback, so that's the, right? The, so the, the Intel side of the coin and, and had the same conversation with our leadership when I came on board, same thing. It's like, look, I'm here to solve problems, right? With technology we haven't created yet <laughs> for customers that don't know they need it yet, right? And if you can get that byline in there, that's really what I think we're doing every day. And I, I really realize that it's it's been a huge, it's already been a huge impact because the way we talk to customers and the way that, you know, we say customers, I'm talking about partners through to the DOD. Um, and so a lot of times we're shaping the discussions before they even have them with the customers, their customers, right? Um, by having it, we're, we're playing it from both sides. So it's really convenient for everybody. To, and it's really getting after the problem, getting things, making things better. Okay, really? so let's talk about because you let you're letting leading right into the next question, which is so what are those technologies or and when I say technologies, I don't mean chips necessarily, right? right. It could be techniques, it could be um, anything around the technology space. What are those technology gaps that you guys feel right now that exist in Department of Defense um, that we need to help them with? Or maybe we still even have the gaps at, at Intel. So let's we'll start with you on this one, Jason. So do you have time for all of that? Because it's going to be a minute, right? So yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll, hey, I can edit. I can edit later. No big deal. So first and foremost, cloud operations going forward are changing dynamically, right? And, and DOD, Air Force is leading the effort, doing a huge deal. Navy's right behind them. Army's kind of playing the catch-up game because they saw risk, right? And they didn't want to spend resources into risk because they saw Air Force trip up in the beginning. Um, and they learn, right? You learn by doing, you go in there, you don't know things, you got to figure it out. Um, one example was cloud operations, right? Anything has to do with cloud efficiencies, cloud organization. Look, I don't want, commanders in the battlefield do not want to rely on a cloud solution to provide them capability. They're risk averse. These folks have to go out into harm's way. They have to deal with, you know, deal with detail, right? If you don't, and I'll, I'll break this down, right? Denied, you know, environments where you don't have connectivity. And then, by the way, we told this to CTOs, Everyone deals with detail, everyone. If you've got a microwave in a break room and you ever put a Wi-Fi router in there, you know <laughs> what detail is, right? It could be the weather capabilities. It doesn't have to be an enemy force. Um, weather and, and atmospherics and things can cause you all kinds of havoc or you know, just too many people move into one town outside of Austin and now you don't have Wi-Fi coverage. Um, you know, detail as we know it. Um, so for, for that example though, um, I told the commander, I said, look, I don't want to give you a 10,000 mile screwdriver to solve your problem. What I want you to do is you bring your screwdriver forward and then I'll have a toolbox on standby when you need a different tool to help you do what you got to do. And so that's one thing. I really think that uh, Intel's done a lot of work in cloud. I had no idea the level of depth that you guys have worked out. Um, it's not, an, you know, we used to call it OPS, just other people's servers, right? <laughs> it's not. Um, and so also understanding the form, you have to refactor, you have to retrain, you have to relearn all that, all that work that goes into true cloud operations and the benefits you get from edge to cloud capability where you can do it on the edge. You can also bring it back. So your headquarters in the rear can bring you more capability forward, real time, real information. You can get the information you need um, to the right people at the right time. So everybody has what we call situational awareness and an operational picture of what's happening, 
Um, because, you know, the last thing you want to do is stop what you're doing to pick up the radio and then call back to headquarters and try to explain to them what you're doing while you're doing it. Right. Right. Yeah. They'll know exa that's, exactly. That's a real thing, right? What we call salute reports, size, size, activity, location, unit, time, and equipment. You have to give that real time as you move through the battle space of what you're doing. Um, and so that that's emotional for a commander versus having somebody who sits behind you in direct support mode, like, hey, I bring all these resources forward. Um, and I, I know what you need. I know you need more medical. I know you need more logistics. You're out of out of instead you know, of asking, it shows up. It just shows up. It's just magically there. And I can forecast your needs based on what you're doing. And it, and it, I don't care if you're doing a humanitarian disaster recovery. Right. Like when Haiti, you know, turned into a pumpkin because we had a giant hurricane blow through. And all of a sudden I'm dispatching troops from all over the world to try to get down there to help out. I've got to jump in a satellite communications farm, you know, because there is no infrastructure left. Um, and so, you know, having someone on the ground who says, hey, I need things instead of somebody else in their rear headquarters watching them and say, oh, he needs things or she needs things and pushing those things at the right time. Um, it, so if, if if I were to boil that all up together, it sounds like situ awareness cloud operations is a good way to kind of bundle that all together. Absolutely. Right. Uh -huh. um, OK, so so that's our first one. Situ yep. awareness, DDIL, cloud operations in these crazy environments. What about you, Ron? What's the next one? Well, I, I guess I would describe it in uh, two terms, right? Understanding what what when we talk about mobility, using the technology to enable operations in this highly mobile environment where you want to push that capability all the way to the edge and do it securely. Um, it makes me think of a couple it's things. Secure. One is, you know, um, having spent a huge portion of my career in various aspects of cybersecurity, whether taking, you know, dealing with other people's lack of cybersecurity or trying to fix our own, whatever that is. Um, the one thing that's clear is that the, the bigger your, the larger your exposure, the more chances something bad is going to happen to you. And so if, if we think about where we're going with edge capability, high mobility, we're absolutely by sort of definition, increasing the vulnerability surface, if you will. So that means that we've got to ensure from a technology standpoint that we're getting after how do we ensure security? So as soon as you start saying things like that, people think, well, what does zero trust mean in that kind of a space, right? We, if we don't drive in that direction, our, our, our uh, moving to highly uh, capable edge, highly mobile, could be disastrous at the moment that you get into any kind of a conflict, right? Because you won't be able to protect it and maintain it. As Jason referenced, you know, the D-deal issue is huge, but it's also when you're connected, but the people you don't want to be connected to, right? There, so there's that entire space of mobility, capability to the edge, but it's got to be secure. And it's so, got to be secure against that increased vulnerability uh, surface. So is it worth it? I mean, Absolutely. that's a I huge risk, no right? <laughs> it, it, well, it, but it is. It's it's a huge risk, and you know the the risk averseness that you mentioned earlier, Jason. And I'm in the battlefield, and now I had to worry about some guy sending me erroneous data into into my you know troops or into a ship or an aircraft sitting out. I mean, is that worth it, or should I just use something that is I already am familiar with? So, no, so, so I will tell you, we've had this conversation for years across the Army spectrum for sure, right? And and tactical operations. Like I've lived in an environment where we trust the data inherently, right? DOD is willing to spend an exuberant amount of time, resources, money, and capital to get that security because that is how they win. We always win with information. We have the technology to win every ground fight, every air fight, every sea lane because of our technology advances. It's not because the size of our armies. It's not because it's the die hardness of our armies, like the, the emotional, you know, the level of commitment that goes into winning and fighting and, and supporting. It's and it's not just battlefield stuff, it's everything, right? I don't care if you're doing FEMA support missions in in, in New Orleans, right? They, these are the kinds of things we persevere. When the nation gets in trouble and picks up the 911 call, steps the DOD yeah. picks up the phone, right? Yes, sir, what do you need? Right. And then we move out everything in every way. And I don't care if it's a carrier providing nuclear power to the city which people don't realize they can do or everything else, right? We bring field hospitals during, you know, COVID, whatever you need, you call, we haul. Uh, but at the end of the day, understanding that that technology advancement is critical to operations. So we have to have it. 
We can't just take risk averse and say, we'll just do it less. We'll do that when we have to. And we train leaders to adapt to environments where they have less information and have to go on their own or inability to communicate to their headquarters to get guidance. We have that. That is that is a common theme in the Army or in the, DO, in the American Army and DOD. We teach down to the private, the mission and who's doing what and why is it important? Because at the end of the day, if you start treating leaders for whatever reason, whether they get injured on a, you know, like, let's say they just trip on a rock. Like we're not even talking about combat operations. Um, somebody goes down with a heart issue or something else. The next leader steps right in and takes over and it goes all the way down to the lowest corporal. Um, and so having that technological advancement, though, is critical to operations for us. So we yeah. we train with that as an underbed. Um, but but I, but get after uh, and I don't want to cut you off wrong, but one more thing that really just I got to talk about is that I need a, I need leaders to understand when we start talking about one more technology advancement, 5G is everything. It is not 4G plus one. It is not like, hey, I just got a little bit better bandwidth. I got significant capability enhancement capabilities at the edge. And for the, you know, especially for the mobile elements like Air Force forward operations, Army operations, Marine operations, having a 5G capability, a bubble in a zone is critical. So I think if you bring it up to a strategic level for just a minute, okay, let's sure. let's think about this for a minute. Um, one of the highest priorities from national defense for this country is we never want to have to fight an adversary on our home territory. Right. Yet, we also have to deal with the fact that uh, some of our adversaries, either you can use the, the old phrase that was actually a, a Russian general, you know, quantity has a quality all its own. And we have, to, we have to recognize that reality, right, with some of our potential adversaries, as well as the fact that if we're never going to fight a home game, which we hope to never have to do that, that means that if we ever do have to get into a conflict, we want to be an away game. And in order for us to be capable of fighting that away game with our adversaries who also are increasing their technology, and in some cases, use that quantity factor, we've got to be that much more capable. So I think we have no choice but to continue providing increased capability to our national defense forces in order to be able to make that happen. And to do that, we've absolutely got to move into the space we've been talking about here with the, with the capability to the edge, highly secure, despite the fact that it represents, if you, from the classic standpoint, you know, in, increased uh, vulnerability exposure. We've got to solve those problems at the technology level so that the operators can trust what we give them and can use it effectively in that away game environment, which includes the detail challenges and all the things that come with that. And I, I think we have no other option but to continue, continue driving that direction. So how this is great because you guys have covered what three of the six pillars that I out, I'm out there pounding on, right? Security, advanced comms, which 5G, and uh, multi-cloud operations, right? So, I mean, these, these, are, these are three big ones. What about the other ones that are on my list? Well, Edge, we talked about Edge. But what AI. About AI, yeah, thank no, you, Jason. AI. So AI is everything, right? So what we've seen Intel and other partners work on in AI project spaces is amazing. They're doing amazing work in AI. I will tell you, the DoD is slow to adapt to a technology they don't understand because they don't have enough of the right people in the right rooms. Uh, because they don't have the backgrounds, you're not going to go to Army Ranger School and come out as an AI expert. It's oh, just no, not. That's not right? your job, right? right? It's not your job, right? And so understand this. So that's a that's a leader problem. Is that we need more people who understand the real problem. They had the same problem with cybersecurity for years, and we're just getting after it now with an entire uh, DoD effort for Cybercom has stood up. They've got all of the services involved. They've made it. You know, five seven years ago, they made a huge shift and said we're just going to dedicate a large chunk of our communications and capabilities to offensive and defensive cyber operations and said, listen, we've got to protect the DOD. We have to, we have, we are nested in, in technology and we have to protect ourselves and we have to bring that level up significantly. Um, I would say that they have to do the same level of investment, not necessarily to that, that depth, but they definitely need to spend some hard um, resources on AI operations and understand this, it is going to change how we do business. It is going so to think, change everything. Yes. So, so, so I, th I think a, a couple of key points. One, just having spent my last couple of years uh, before I retired uh, in, in the nuclear part of the business, 
one thing everybody should know, as soon as we start talking AI from a defense standpoint, you know, by policy, the US is committed <laughs> that we will never take the human out of that critical decision loop, right? Otherwise, we have Skynet. Be, we don't want always, Skynet. There Skynet. There will always no be Skynet. a human decision. That said, the complexity that we've just been talking about of the, these technologies to provide capability to the, the warfighter, the capability to the mission, in and of themselves, artificial intelligence could be hugely valuable and has proven it in different places to actually ensure the technology, I'll say, can dynamically adapt as required to provide that decision maker the information and insights in a way that, that reduces their cognitive load so that they can actually have clearer situational awareness and be better prepared to make well-informed decisions in a highly timely fashion. So there's huge opportunity for AI. AI is not about, quote, Skynet. I mean, maybe some people think it is, but that's not the point. It, it, no. it, AI provides value in all these other ways to improve the ability of the human to make better, faster decisions. That's the kind of space that we've got to drive in. So it kind well, of takes away all of the, there's so much data now, right? right? So you guys are seeing AI as kind of a way of filtering down that data or uh, compiling it into something that a human can so, actually work with. So ISR, right? Intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance information is massive. There's a massive amount of data coming in from millions of different data points, whether it's human intelligence, you know, uh, imagery, whatever. Having an AI engine helps facilitate that is one thing. But I'm talking about everything, logistics, right? Predictive mm -hmm. maintenance. Like how long is that truck tire going to last before you need a new truck tire? Right. I can do predictive maintenance because everybody knows a lot, you know, the, the, you know, the, the art of war, right? Yeah. Um, the army walks on its stomach, <laughs> right? If you don't yeah. have the things you need when you need them, you're not moving anywhere. People ask me, why did Gulf War One take so long? Because, you know, it's not that far to Baghdad. I said, well, we had to stop four times for gas. <laughs> right. So I would jump forward. I would drive to the end of my gas tank. I would stop. And then we would wait patiently for the trucks to get there and then fill back up and then continue on our efforts. Right? In, in Iraq, weren't there just oil fields everywhere? Just plenty yeah, of yeah. oil well, it's, fields, it's, right? It's complicated, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, well, th there's that, right? That's the thing. So, and then, so again, back to AI, having the information, like, can I use that fuel for the things I want to do with it? Right. Yes, no, no. no. But, this I, I like where you're going here because what it does is it takes some of the mundane work and some of the uh, away from humans doing it so humans can start looking at more strategic things instead right. of tactical things as much, right? I mean, and, and solve problems, right? Solving problems with information that's accurate and updated and, and helpful, right? Helpful information. Um, I have a great example of this human resources you know, stuff. We looked at an algorithm because we're trying to figure out why we had a bunch of senior army leaders all leaving at the same time in their career, right? And we couldn't figure it out. Like they're all leaving and they all happen to be female. Top of their class, number one in their class, excellent leaders, and they're all leaving at the same point. We ran in, we ran ORSA data that's an analytical um, leadership uh, team, and they, they ran out analytics at it. They couldn't find a data point that would that would suggest why they all left. Um, and then we realized they turned 30, and they started making life decisions for their families about, do I want to go off and have children? Is that conducive for military operations? What do I want to do? And the Army spent a lot of time and resources trying to figure out, how do I retain that top-tier talent and make sure they can still be productive in their lives, right, in their personal lives and what they really wanted to do? And so the army took a hard look at that and said, we should probably address this, right? But it took months of hard data analytics. AI would have figured it out in four minutes. They're all the same age brackets, right? And put about and, and pulled out one red line and said, this is the one common denominator out of all the other data that you have. Um, and it would have taken an AI engine probably the split hair of a second to figure that out. And it took us like- So th this is, I, I like that you're bringing this up because it can be for personnel, it can right. be for logistics, for battle, or there's lots of places where AI can, can fit lots. in in the military and also in, in business as well, right? This is not just uh, military. So, well, hey guys, this has been great. You've taught me some things. You made me cry. Thank you. You're the first guests that have ever made me cry on this show. On my other show with my wife, I cry all the time. So you guys <laughs> should watch that one.
Thank you for listening to Embracing Digital Transformation today. If you enjoyed our podcast, give it five stars on your favorite podcasting site or YouTube channel. You can find out more information about Embracing Digital Transformation at embracingdigital.org. Until next time, go out and do something wonderful.